In the previous video, we conducted two sample tests of whether population means were the same. Now we discuss a test that simultaneously compares several means to determine if they came from equal populations. That test is called the Analysis of Variance, or ANOVA test, and it is a general linear model that we use. And we'll take a look at our objectives briefly. And feel free to look at these. I'll unpause the video. So when and why might we want to use an analysis of variance or an ANOVA? Well, we want to use the ANOVA when we want to compare means. We can use the t-test to compare means, but it has some limitations. You can only compare two means at the same time. Often we'd like to compare means from three or more groups. And with the t-test, it can only be used with one predictor or one independent variable. The ANOVA compares several means and with it we can it can be used to when we have manipulated more than one independent variable or if we've treated more than one of the independent variables. And it's an extension of the regression model and hence the term general linear model. So why don't we just use a lot of different t-tests to compare our groups? Well, let's take a look at that. Let's say that we want to use the p-value of 0.05 as our mark to determine significance, and that's a pretty traditional uh, significance level, 0.05. Because it's a 5% mark, we are saying that we're willing to accept the risk of, accept, of rejecting the null hypothesis when, in fact, it is true 5% of the time. Now when we do multiples though, it's not a 5% chance that we end up getting, but 5% for each of the tests that we do. And we can work that out uh, with a calculation. So we have 5% when we're, let's say we have three different groups here, group one, group two, group three, and we want to compare all of these. So here we're comparing group one versus group two in a t-test then group 2 versus group 3 in a t-test, and then group 1 versus group 3 in a t-test. But you have 5% for each time. Well, when we combine those, we find what we call a family-wise error rate. And that family-wise error rate can be determined by 1 minus 0 0.95 to the nth power, the n being how many groups that you have. So in this case, the, the point zero, or excuse me, the 0 0.95 is a complement to the 0 0.05 level of significance, and by complement, I'm talking about the C-O-M-P-L-E-M-E-N-T. Not that it's making the 0 0.05 significance level feel better about itself. The probability of not making an error is the 0.95. So in this case, we would, if we did the calculation, and we raised 0 0.95 to the third power and subtract that result from 1, we would find that we'd have about a 14.3 percent error rate, which is unacceptable, especially when we're shooting for a 5 percent overall error rate. That's just with three groups. Imagine if you had 10 groups. We would have about a 40 percent chance of error. Obviously that would be unacceptable as well. So what do we get from ANOVA? Let's take a look. Like a t-test, the ANOVA tests the null hypothesis that the means are the same. So if you were to use a t-test to compare two means, and you found that that's, uh, those two means were significantly different from each other, then you were to run an, an ANOVA with those same means, or the same groups, you would find that those means would also be significantly different from each other. And as I said previously, with the ANOVA, we can do that with even more than two variable groups. And as with the t-test, our null hypothesis is that the means are the same. And with the ANOVA, the experimental or alternate hypothesis is that the means differ. There is a point to note that the ANOVA is an omnibus test. It t tests for an overall difference between the groups. It tells us that the group means are different, but it doesn't tell us exactly which of the means differ. And what does the ANOVA tell 
in regression versus what we are when we are comparing means. Let's take a look and see. When we have the ANOVA table in regression, we find that what it's used to assess whether the regression model is good at predicting an outcome, particularly in a simple linear regression when we only have the one variable. Obviously, with multiple linear regression, we need to also look at the coefficients table. But overall, the ANOVA in regression is telling us whether the regression model is good at predicting an outcome. Is the overall model of all of the independent variables providing us greater predictive value than just using the mean of the dependent variable as our predictor. When we're doing ANOVA in experiments though, we're using it to see whether experimental manipulations lead to differences in the performance uh, on an outcome or the dependent variable. By manipulating or treating a predictor variable, can we cause, and therefore predict, a change in the behavior? We're sort of asking the same question, but in experiments, we systematically manipulate the predictor. In regression, we don't. So let's look at some of the theory behind ANOVA. We start our ANOVA by calculating how much variability there is between scores. That's total sums of squares. Then we calculate how much of the variability we can explain by the model we fit to the data. In other words, how much variability is due to the experimental manipulation or, or the treatment that we did on the group. And that's called the model sum of squares. And then we also look at how much cannot be explained or how much of the variability cannot be explained by the model. How much variability is due to the individual differences in performance? Residual sum, this, that, and that's called the residual sums of squares. So we compare the amount of the variability explained by the model, or the experiment, to the, the error in the model, in other words, the individual differences. And that ratio is called the F ratio. If the model explains a lot more variability than what it can't explain, then the experimental manipulation has had a significant effect on the outcome or on the dependent variable. In other videos we've talked about using the F-test, but let's take a look, closer look at the F-distribution itself. It'll help us in our understanding of our analysis of variance results. The F-distribution was named in to honor Sir Ronald Fisher, one of the founders of modern day statistics, and it is used to test whether two samples are from populations having equal variances. It's also used when we want to compare several population means simultaneously. When we compare si simultaneously compare population means or means from several populations, it's called analysis of variance. And in both of the situations listed up on the page. The populations are supposed to follow a normal distribution and the data must at least be interval scale. Let's take a look at some of the characteristics of the f-distribution. There is a family of f-distributions like when we have a family of z-distributions or excuse me of t-distributions. In other words a particular member of the family is determined by two parameters the degrees of freedom in the numerator and the degrees of freedom in the denominator. So you can see by the different degrees of freedoms we have we get different F distributions here and because of the limitations of software you can see that our distributions appear to be touching the line but truly they are asymptotic in other words they go on out to infinity without ever touching the X axis. And the F distribution is a continuous distribution meaning it can assume an infinite number of values between zero and positive infinity. And the way that we calculate it, you'll see shortly, the F value cannot be negative. The smallest value is zero. The F distribution is positively skewed because the variance of the larger, or excuse me, the larger variance is placed on the numerator and the smaller variances in the denominator as we'll see shortly.
So it's positively skewed with the long tail all the way to the right. As the number of degrees of freedom increases in both the numerator and the denominator, the distribution approaches a normal distribution. And again, it is asymptotic as f per proceeds toward infinity, the curve approaches the x-axis but never touches it. When might we use the f distribution to compare variances? Well, let's take a look. In these examples here, you can see where we would want to compare the means of two different uh, variables here. So in this example, we have two barth shearing machines. They're set to produce steel bars of the same length. The bars, therefore, should have the same mean length. We want to ensure that in addition to having the same mean length, they also have similar variation. So we can compare the two, the variance of the two barth shearing machines. And as we'll see, the f-distribution is used to test the hypothesis that the variance of one normal population equals the variance of another normal population. We could take a look at the f-test for comparing two population variances using the f or the hypothesis testing. And what's the first step as we do with all of our hypothesis testing? The first step is that we assume that nothing is going on and we then create our null hypothesis and alternate hypothesis, the alternate being what do we get sh if we expect something to be going on. So here's our null hypothesis. We assume that nothing is going on, that the variance, the first variance is equal to the second variance, and then our alternate variance, or excuse me, our alternate hypothesis is that what do we expect to get if something is in fact going on. And that, in that case, is that our two variances are not equal. For the f-test, we have two sets of degrees of freedom. One is the degrees of freedom for our first group, and then the second is the variance for our second group. So we collect our little sample, and we calculate out the variance for each of the groups. Then we go and find our f critical value, determine our decision rule. We've, uh, uh, in order to calculate the f critical value, we need to first pick what is the significance level we we are willing to accept, or the risk that we're willing to accept of rejecting a null hypothesis when in fact it is true. In other words, what's this risk we're willing to accept? The type one error. Then we go find our F critical value in the back of our book or using Excel software or some kind of software to help us calculate that out. We decide what our decision rule is, is that we will uh, reject the null hypothesis if the F test statistic is greater than the F critical value. We calculate our one little, uh, or we collect our one little sample, find out what it is that we got. We decide based on comparing the F test statistic against the F critical value if what we found is extremely unlikely. If it is extremely unlikely, we call baloney on the assumption that nothing is going on, and we accept the alternate hypothesis that, hey, something is in fact going on. And we can find in using the Andy Field book, we can find the F critical value uh, in the appendix A.3 page A94. To find the critical value of, an, of F for a two-tailed test, we just divide the significance level in half, and then we refer to the deg appropriate degrees of freedom in the appendix. And that might sound a little confusing because the F test itself, or the F distribution itself, seems like it's a, it got a one tail because it's skewed to the right, but it is not the case. And an, and an example will help us to see that. Let's take a look at one. So Lammers Limos offers limousine service from the City Hall in Toledo, Ohio to the Metro Airport in Detroit. So our president wants to look at two different routes. One is via US-25 and the other is via I-75. He wants to study the time it takes to drive to the airport using each route and then compare the results. He collected the following sample data, because our president doesn't have enough to do with his spare time, and that and the following data is reported here in minutes. Using the point one zero significance level, is there a difference in the variation in the driving times for the two routes?
looking at our keyword here, difference, we can tell whether this is a one-tailed or a two-tailed test. So which is it? That's right, it's a two-tailed test. And what's the first step of hypothesis testing? We assume that nothing is going on and we create our null hypothesis based off of that assumption. So our null hypothesis is that the variance of one route, the first route, US Route 25, is the same as the variance of the population variance for the mean, or excuse me, the Interstate 75 route. The alternate hypothesis is what do we expect to get if something is in fact going on and that is that the population mean driving times between the US 25 route and the I-75 route are not the same or should I say the population variance of the driving times between the US 25 and the I-75 route are not the same. And then we get to our significance level. So what's the most amount of risk that we are willing to uh, accept of rejecting a null hypothesis when it's actually true? We've selected 0 0.10. We've decided that the test statistic is the F distribution. And then we go on to our decision rule. As we do in all hypotheses tests, we just state the decision rule. And in this case, we're going to reject the null hypothesis if the F test statistic is greater than the F critical value. Because this is a two-tailed test, we divide the 0 0.10 significance level in half. The N1, or in other words, the number of observations for Route 25, is 7. So our degrees of freedom are 6 and the N for our second route, which is Interstate 75, is 8, so our degrees of freedom are 7. So we can go to the 0 .05 table in the back of our book, and we find that the critical value is 3.87. I've also provided the way that you can t determine this using the Excel built-in functions, or you can go to Megastat and use the probability distribution for the F distribution and produce the same results. What's nice about using the Megastat approach is it will also create the F distribution graphically for you and shade it if you so choose, like here. So we've determined our decision rule. Our next step is to collect our sample and determine our, calculate our test statistics so that we can see how likely it was that we got what we got. Let's go ahead and and for step five, we've computed the value of F and we make a decision. As we can see in our formula here, we take the variance of our first route, which was route 25, and divide it by our second route variance, which was Interstate 75. We run the numbers and we determine that we have 4.23. And if you don't recall, the S is standard deviation and this is our standard deviation right here and here and as we've stated earlier we put the larger of the two variances on the numerator so that we only have a table that is um, one-sided in the back of our book and we have fewer entries required so based on what we found how likely is it that we got what we got well, going back, we found that our F critical value was 3.87. So that means our rejection region is everything above 3.87 or greater than 3.87. We came up with 4.23, which is in the rejection region. So our decision is that it is very unlikely that we got what we got. So we're going to call baloney on the assumption that nothing is going on. Our decision is to reject the null hypothesis because the computed F value, the F test statistic that we calculated using our one little sample that we found is larger than the F critical value 3.87. We conclude that there is a difference in the variation of the travel times along the two routes. We can use the F distribution in our ANOVA to compare two or more sample means. When we're comparing the means of two or more populations, we call that the analysis of variance, or ANOVA technique.
in which we compare the two or more population means to determine whether they could be equal. Why would we want to do an ANOVA instead of the test of differences in population means from the, la the last video, in other words, the t-test? Well, we discussed that earlier in the video, but let's go over it one more time. If we do multiple t-tests, we'll accumulate our type 1 error. If we have six tests to do at a 0 0.05 level of significance, the probability that we do not make an incorrect decision, remember that 0.95? The probability that we would not make an incorrect decision due to sampling error in any of the six independent tests is the, would be equal, equal to the 0.95 raised to the sixth power which is equal to 0.735. So the probability of at least one error due to sampling is found by subtracting that 0.735 from one. In other words, it comes out to 0.265. So if we conduct six independent t-tests, the likelihood of rejecting the true null hypothesis because of sampling error isn't 0.05, but it's actually 0.265, or 26.5% of the time. ANOVA statistically calculates or corrects for that. So when we're comparing the means of two or more populations, we state that the null hypothesis is that the population means are all the same. And the alternate hypothesis is that at least one of the means is different. We use the test statistic is the F distribution, and our decision rule is to reject the null hypothesis if the F computed value, or the F test statistic that we calculate from our one little sample is greater than the F table value with numerator and denominator degrees of freedom. So with the ANOVA we want to determine whether the various sample means came from a single population or populations with different means. We compare the sample means by using their variances and that's where the F statistic comes into play. Essentially what we're doing is that we're estimating the population variance two different ways and then we find the ratio of those two different ways or those two, the estimates using those two different methods. If the ratio is about one then it's logical that the two estimates are the same and we conclude that the population means are the same. If the ratio is very different from one then we conclude that the populations are not the same. Let's go ahead and take a look at the F statistics some more in an, in an ANOVA analysis. Some of these are new terms that you may not have seen before, but we'll continue to go over them. So you can just absorb what you can now and we'll continue to drive on. The slide here shows us how we can calculate the F test statistic. We have three types of variation that we consider for doing the F test. You have the total variation, and that is the sum of the square differences between each observation and the total mean, sometimes called the grand mean, of all observations from all the groups. Then we have the treatment, or the model variation, and that's the sum of the square differences between each treatment, or each group, mean, and the grand or the overall mean. We finally we have the random variation and that is our sum of square differences between each observation and its treatment mean. That's also called the sum of squares residuals or the sum of square squares errors. And We'll talk about m more of these in our example. So we have our K populations being sampled and so the numerator degrees of freedom in our F stat or our F statistic is k minus 1 and if there are a total of n observations the denominator degrees of freedom is n minus k. Our test statistic we then compute by our mean square module model in other words the variation of our based on our model or our treatment divided by the mean square residual and we can look at an example. In this scenario we're comparing the satisfaction level of customers for four different airways or four different airlines American, Delta, United, and US Airways. You can read the scenario yourself 
But our question is, is there a difference in the mean satisfaction level among the four airlines? We're going to use the 0 0.01 significance level. And just with other hypothesis testing, what's the first step that we do? We assume that nothing is going on. And for us, nothing going on means that the mu of American is equal to the mu of Delta, which is equal to the mu of United, which is equal to the mu of US Airways. In other words, the population mean of each of the airlines is equal. What do we expect to get if something is in fact going on? Well, the means are not all equal. In other words, the population means are not all the same, or at least two mean scores are not equal. What's the most risk of making a type 1 error we're willing to take? Well, where the most risk we're willing to accept is the 0 0.01 level of significance that we are going to make a type 1 error, which means we're going to accept no more than a 0 0.01 level or chance of rejecting a null hypothesis when, in fact, it is true. We're going to find the appropriate test statistic. We've already determined that that's going to be the F distribution or the F test because we're comparing means of two or more than two groups. Next, we state our decision rule. So we state our decision rule in step number four. And in order to, de to determine the decision rule, we need the critical value. In appendix A3 of our book, we have two sets of values. The, the, the critical values for alpha equals 0 0.05, and the critical values for alpha equals 0 0.01. So we are kind of limited. Fortunately, we have what we need. We need to know in order to calculate or determine which of the are the which is the correct f critical value we need the numerator degrees of freedom and the denominator degrees of freedom and the numerator degrees of freedom is found by k minus 1 which is the number of the treatments or the number of groups minus 1 and then the denominator degrees of freedom is n minus k which is the total number of observations minus the number of groups so our numerator degrees of freedom is 3, and our denominator degrees of freedom is 18. If we go ahead and calculate our f critical value using Excel, we can use the function that's right here, or Megastat using the function right here. Our f critical value is 5.09. So our decision rule is we're going to reject the null if the computed test statistic value using our sample data that we collect exceeds 5.09. So if our F test statistic that we calculated with our one little sample is greater than our F critical value that we calculated from Excel or from the back of our book, we are going to reject the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis again is that all of the airline population means are the same or equal. Step 5 is next. With that step five, we calculate what did we get with our one little sample? How likely was it that we got what we got? And then if it's very unlikely, we're gonna call baloney on the assumption that's nothing, that nothing is going on. The challenge here is that with the ANOVA te technique, there are several parts to step five. And we summarize the parts in what's called an analysis of variance table or an, an ANOVA table that you've seen before in our regression example. The first thing we do is we calculate the sums of squares total. And that's the total variation. It's the sum of the square differences between each observation and the total mean of all observations from all groups. So if we were to go back to our data, we would capture the mean of all of our different groups. And that would be the grand mean or the total mean. And once we have our total mean, we subtract that grand mean or that total mean from each individual observation in our data set. Then we take each of those differences, we square them, and then we sum them up to get our sums of square total. Second, we calculate the sums of square residual or the random variation that we have, or the sums of square error, as it's sometimes called. And that's the sum of the square differences between each observation and its respective group mean. So how do we do that? Well, if we have our data set, we calculate the mean 
for each individual group. Then we take each individual observation and subtract from it that group mean. So in the case of American Airlines, we would take that 94, find out what the mean is first of all of the, of the entire column, and then we would go subtract from 94 that mean that we just calculated. Then we would do that for each separate group. We would then square each of those individual differences between the individual observation and the group mean, and then we'd sum all of those up for all of the different columns, and that gives us our sums of square residual. And I use here the x bar sub t as uh, the t being for treatment for each of the groups. I don't want to use the g to conf because I don't want to confuse it with the grand mean. So we use a subscript of t here and that refers to each of the treatments. And finally to capture the model sums of square what we do is we just subtract the sums of square residual from the sums of square total and then we get our sums of square model. The column means or the group means are fairly straightforward. We sum up the, each of the columns and then we divide it by the n of each column and we get the x bar for American is 87.25, Delta 78.20, United 72.86, and US Airways 69. The x bar sub g, if you remember, that's our grand mean, is calculated differently, but only a little bit. We just sum up all of our observations for all groups and divide it by the total n. So 4 plus 5 plus 7 plus 6 is equal to 22, that's our denominator. And then all of these variables add, or observations added up equals 1664. And we get a grand mean of 75.64. Now that we have each of the group means or the treatment means, and the grand mean, we can do other calculations. We can find our deviations that we need for our sums of squares. We're computing the deviation of each observation from the grand mean, squaring those, and summing the result for all of the 22 observations that we have to get our sums of square total. In our top two tables, we can see how this is done. So we have our x bar grand, or x bar sub g, or our overall grand mean or our overall mean however you want to call it and from each observation we're going to subtract that and here are the results of the x sub i or each observation minus the grand mean for each observation in each of the groups then we square that result so here 18.36 squared is 337.09 and so on down the line then we sum all of those up. Then we sum the totals and we come up with our 1485.09 which is our sums of square total. In the lower two tables we're calculating out the sums of square residual. So we're computing the deviation of each observation from that observations groups mean. That sounds a little bit confusing. But what we do is we take the column for American, we find the mean of that column or that treatment, and we sub use that mean to subtract from each observation to get the deviation from each observation and its group mean or its treatment mean. That's what these values are. So the x bar sub t for American is going to be different from the x bar f um, for Delta and which will be different from the x bar from United and, the, and which will be different from the x bar for US Airways. Once we have each of the deviations for each observation we square those deviations which is what we have here so 6.75 squared is 45.5625 and so on down the line once we do that for each individual observation from each group, we sum all of those squared deviations in each column 
or in each treatment group. Then we sum all of those across and that gives us our sums of square residual. So we have the first two. Now we have to calculate our final sums of square value, the sums of square model. Are you looking forward to that? You might be if you remember how we calculate it. All we do is we take to the sums of square total minus the sums of square residual to get the sums of square model. So 1485.09 was our sums of square total. 594.41 was our sums of square residual and we get 890.68 as our sums of square model. I put the ANOVA table in here again as a reminder so you can see how we calculate that out and you'll notice that we do actually have a formula that we can calculate out the sums of square model but it is simpler to just take the sums of square residual and subtract it from the sums of square total. Running this calculation though would be a good way to check your work or vice versa you can run the actual calculation and then check your work by summing them up see if you get the x uh, the sums of square total now that we have that information we can start filling out the ANOVA table so our sums of square model is 890.68 so we put that in our sums of square model we put in our sums of square residual eight nine, uh, excuse me 594.41 our sums of square total 1485.09 and our degrees of freedom is k minus 1, or in other words, the number of treatments, or groups, minus 1. Our degrees of freedom for the residual is n minus k, or the total number of observations, minus the number of groups. And the sums of square total is n minus 1, which you can then use as a check to make sure that 18 plus 3 equals 21. In other words, our model degrees of freedom plus our residual degrees of freedom should equal our total degrees of freedom. And if it doesn't, you got to go back and check your work. The next thing we want to fill out is our mean square values. And if you look at our calculations here, the mean square of the model is just the sums of square of the model divided by the degrees of freedom. So we have the sums of square of the model, we divide it by the degrees of freedom, and we get our mean square for the model, 296.89. Mean square residual is calculated similarly. We take the sums of square residual, which is 594.41, and divide it by our degrees of freedom, our sums of square degrees of freedom, which is 18, and we get 33.02. To calculate our F statistic, our calculated F statistic, our computed F statistic, we simply divide our mean square of the model divided by our mean square residual, in other words the signal to noise ratio, and we get 8.99. If you remember back to our calculation, our F critical value that we determined is 5.09, and our decision rule is that we're going to reject the null hypothesis if the computed value of the sample F statistic exceeds 5.09. So in our case, the sample statistic that we computed using our sample data for the F value is 8.99 which is greater than the F critical value of 5.09 so we reject the null hypothesis that all of the means, population means are equal. In our view the, and based on the analysis the population means are not equal the mean scores are not the same for each of the four airlines. At this point we can only conclude that there is a difference in the treatment means. We cannot determine though which treatment groups differ or how many of the treatment groups differ. And that's really all there is to calculating an analysis of variance. I hope you enjoyed the video and we'll see you in the next one.